So, I sent the expedition out yesterday with about 1,500 men to start. So, you'll outnumber the Polish forces about 10 to 1? Right, I'm thinking we've got this one in the bag. Um, sir, have you checked the latest stat report from the math geeks yet? No, I haven't actually. Thanks for the reminder. Oh no. In case you missed the last video, History House Productions now has a Patreon. All donations will directly support the channel and the very special history-themed mixtape I will be dropping when we reach 100,000 subscribers. All links will be in the description. It's the Napoleonic Wars and the French are besieging the British. In Spain. And the Portuguese are there for some reason too. By 1810, Cadiz was the last city standing between Napoleon and his domination of Spain, and pretty much everyone knew it. If the French were able to concentrate enough troops on the city, it would almost certainly fall, and the British would not have that crap. To prevent further French buildup, the British and their allies started making surprise visits along the Spanish coast in order to distract the French. It was for this purpose that the British approved a strike on the castle of Fuenjirola. To accomplish this side quest, the British pulled together a task force of 1,285 British regulars, 640 Spanish riflemen, and 516 multinational troops, all under the command of Major General Andrew Thomas Blaney, who was to be joined by several thousand Spanish rebels once he landed. Opposing Blaney's force were 490 Polish and French troops spread out over three garrisons. The town of Alaorin, furthest from the castle, housed 200 Polish infantry and 80 French dragoons, commanded by corps leader Ignacy Bronisch. The town of Mijas, closest to Fuenjorola, contained a small garrison of 60 Polish soldiers under the command of Lieutenant Estahu Helmitsky. The castle of Fuenjorola itself, however, was garrisoned by just 150 Poles, commanded by Captain Franciszek Mokosiewicz. So, considering this is Polish history, they seem like pretty standard odds. Despite their overwhelming numerical superiority, the British expedition started out on the wrong foot. The naval arm of Blaney's task force was supposed to be headed by the British ship of the line Rodney and the Spanish ship of the line El Vencedor, but the Spanish ship was so trashed that Blaney just left without it and the 900 soldiers it was transporting. Furthermore, Blaney had to leave the Rodney as well in order to tow the El Vencedor, depriving him of both of his biggest ships. It's kind of like when your mom tells you that she's leaving in five minutes with or without you, except this time she actually followed through. Blaney's diminished flotilla then sailed to Ceuta to pick up the 640 Spanish soldiers. Arriving on October 12th, a Friday, the Spanish were taken aboard and immediately became grouchy that the British only had beef to feed them. After all, after getting on a ship to literally go kill other Catholics, I too would be worried that God would judge me instead for eating meat on a Friday. Two days later, with or without God's favor, the task force landed a few miles to the west of Fuenjurola with 1,500 men, less than 400 of which were British, which, let me just say, for the one country that has ever left the EU, the British sure are okay with having other Europeans fight for them. Speaking of other Europeans, remember those thousands of Spanish rebels that were supposed to show up? Oh good, an envoy. How many more of you guys are there? Well. I think my cousin Juan is supposed to show up around noon. Wow, you guys sure are a tight-knit army, huh? Well, I mean, yeah, there's only 12 of us. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? However, the 12 Spanish guerrillas soon made themselves useful by scouting ahead of the main force and ambushing some poles who were guarding a herd of cattle, so... Um... Good job. I guess. Expecting the outnumbered Poles to surrender without a fight, Blaney sent an envoy offering terms if the garrison surrendered the castle. Mikosiewicz responded by telling the British to come and take it. Gang, it feels good to be a gangster. Now, unlike some of us, Blaney hadn't learned how to handle rejections, so he responded with punitive violence. Or at least he wanted to, his gunboats hadn't came yet, so he just kinda sat there for a while. Later in the afternoon though, once his ships arrived, Blaney ordered a naval bombardment of the castle walls. This was kind of a problem for the Poles inside the castle. They had four small cannons, but their Spanish gunners had mysteriously disappeared as soon as the British showed up, and none of the Poles had ever shot a cannon before. 
Thankfully, beginner's luck is a thing, and on the first volley, the poles sunk a British ship and then damaged several others, forcing the flotilla away from the walls. This irritated Blaney, who ordered his multinational troops to storm the castle from the land, where they were immediately repulsed by the Polish cannons, which had switched over to grape shot they had just found in a closet, and I'm not making that up. Blaney tried again, but finally gave up for the day when the commander of the British regiment was killed and the Spanish refused to fight because, and I quote, good Catholics don't fight on Sundays. Which... <laughs> No hate to any Spanish people watching this, but with a work ethic like that, it's a miracle you ever retook your peninsula. <laughs> Meanwhile, a few miles away in Mijas, Lieutenant Helmetsky overheard all the commotion in the distance, and after sending word to the larger garrison in Ala Odrin, decided to sneak over to the castle to reinforce Makoshevich with his 60 men. Climbing out through the windows of their barracks under the cover of darkness, Helmetsky and his 60 poles probably tiptoed or something over to the castle and were shocked to find the route completely unguarded. Turns out that the route was unguarded because Blaney had been arguing with the Spanish commander about fighting on Sundays and wasn't able to convince the Spanish to go occupy the road between Mijas and Fuenjerela until after the Poles had already escaped. Now sitting outside in the pouring rain with God probably furious at them for doing things on the Sabbath, the Spanish finally decided that it would just be easier to attack Mijas outright. After all, there was no way that the 60 Poles in there could resist the 600 Spanish troops. In the time that it took the Spanish troops to reach the town, Bronish's 280 men from Ala Orin had marched down to Mijas and set up an ambush for them. In the ensuing battle, 20 Spaniards were killed or wounded and 40 were captured. Bronish then began to slowly advance on Blaney's left flank. However, Blaney wasn't completely idle during the night either. He finally started to unload his cannons from the transport ships and set up two artillery emplacements. But by the morning, the Poles still refused to budge, so Blaney sent another envoy offering terms of surrender to the garrison. Guys, I need your help. The British are sending another ambassador to negotiate a surrender, but I already used my witty one-liner yesterday! Well, if you don't have a good comeback, you, you don't have to let him in. Oh yeah, I could just not let the envoy in. Gang, it feels good to be a gangster. Unfortunately for the Poles, the Rodney and El Vencedor finally arrived just then, reinforcing the British with almost a thousand more soldiers. The Poles were now outnumbered almost 12 to 1. Now confident in victory, Blaney ordered his redcoats to withdraw to the beach so that they could collect rations, which took about an hour. One minute to eat their food, and 59 minutes to cry about having to eat British food. In the meantime, however, the Poles had spotted 10 dragoons from Bronish's vanguard and launched an attack on the remaining 1,000 Allied troops guarding the cannons, routing them with the help of the dragoons. The Poles then captured the British cannons and began shelling the British on the beach with their own guns. We're gonna be killed by our own cannons! How humiliating! Wait, if we get hurt by our own guns, think of all the money we can make in the lawsuit. You're right. Hey, hey, hit my arm or something. We're gonna be rich. However, now reinforced by the troops from the El Vencedor, Blaney launched a counteroffensive and recaptured the cannons, but not before the Poles had blown up most of the ammunition. Blaney then saw a large body of men approaching his left flank. Assuming they were the rest of the long overdue Spanish guerrillas, Blaney told his men to hold their fire and approach the reinforcements with a small escort. Unfortunately, the reinforcements were actually Bronish's 200 Polish infantry who had just arrived from Mijas. Hey, you're the Spanish reinforcements, right? Um, me, uh, no, no habla, uh, inglés. Wow, 
Those Spanish sure are dumb. I'll put the bag over his head. With their leader now kidnapped by the Poles, the British retreated to the beach again where they were once more bombarded by their own artillery that the Poles had recaptured. Only the firepower of the Rodney and El Vencedor kept the Poles at bay long enough for the British and their allies to escape into the Mediterranean. The Battle of Fuenjurola had been a disaster for the British. They left behind 65 dead, 70 wounded, and 200 men, 300 rifles, 5 cannons, and 60,000 rounds of ammunition captured. The Poles lost just 20 soldiers. Makoshevich, Helmetsky, and Bronish all received the Legion of Honor from Napoleon himself. Blaney would remain in French captivity for over four years, and if you look through British casualty records from the Napoleonic Wars, the three pages that cover the Battle of Fuenjarola have all been torn out. The British and Polish have never fought each other again. Connor, is it finally happening? Is this a Polish story with a happy ending? Napoleon would lose the war and Poland would be conquered by Russia just five years later. No, stop, take it back!